Thank you all for coming today. My name is Jay Hamilton, and as Director of the Department of Communication, I'd like to welcome you to this year's Reveille Symposium, which is focused on polarization and trust in the local media. It's a really fitting topic for a Reveille Symposium because it's named after Mr. Roland Reveille. Uh, Mr. Reveille went to Stanford in the 1950s. He was on the Stanford Daily. He did an internship that changed his life. It directed him toward journalism. He went on to own many community newspapers. And in the 1980s, he and his wife, Pat, uh, made an endowment gift to Stanford. And through the magic of compound interest, that has supported more than 300 interns over the years. Uh, yeah. Uh, every year, we have more than 20 students. And if there are students, Here's the product placement. It's a wonderful opportunity. It can give you up to $7,800 to work at a newspaper or news outlet during the summer. And I hope that you will consider doing that. Unfortunately, Mr. Reveille passed away on November 25th, but his enthusiasm for journalism and curiosity about the world lives on in events like this one today. Uh, Today, we're very fortunate. Janine Zakaria is going to be the moderator. Janine is a former international correspondent for the Washington Post, Bloomberg News, Reuters, and she's an award-winning teacher and a very deft and engaged moderator, which you are about to see. So, Janine, the floor is yours. Thank you all for coming. Uh, how's the sound? Because it sounds weird to me in this cavernous room. Good? Okay. In 2010, legendary Nightline news anchor and Stanford alum Ted Koppel wrote an opinion piece in the Washington Post lamenting the ascent of opinion-driven cable news. Quote, while I can appreciate the financial logic of drowning television viewers in a flood of opinions designed to confirm their own biases, the trend is not good for the republic. It's hard to argue with him 14 years later, and I remember at the time that the piece felt very prescient to me, and it's something that I've assigned over the years to my students. But this panel today is not about the impact of cable news or social media or a former president disparaging the press as enemies of the people countless times, and it's not going to present all the Pew stats on confidence in the media and the state of polarization in the country. Know that the data is grim. What I want to do today is leverage the short amount of time we have to surface examples of potential and tried solutions to restore and shore up the democratic functioning in this nation in this critical election year. Fixing polarization, as the many political scientists, scientists and economists and sociologists here at Stanford, I'm certain, will tell us, cannot be done solely via the media. But tonight's focus is on what the press and certainly the mainstream legacy news outlets can do to help reduce this phenomenon. Because as Joy Mayer of the organization Trusting News wrote last year, it's true that accessible to reliable, credible information is key to our community's ability to deliberate and self-govern. It's also true that people only sharing it, people only believe in the accuracy of information if they trust the people sharing it. This is the central event in a series of discussions we're hosting here in the Department of Communication at Stanford with the hope that we can identify some best practices and lessons learned to share with smaller news newsrooms across the country, especially those tiny newsrooms, sometimes as tiny as a reporter of one, as they consider how to practice journalism in this trying, divided, and I would say often hostile environment. Before I introduce our esteemed uh, journalists and newsroom leaders who I'll be in conversation with this evening, and by the way, we are recording this, um, though we're not live streaming it, so it will be available afterwards. I just want to share my personal condolences with the Rebley family as well and read what I wrote after his passing that I when I circulated a story about his death. You may not have heard of him if you aren't from the Bay Area or affiliated with Stanford, but Roland Rebley did more to launch journalism careers than anyone I've ever met. As the funder and founder of the Stanford Rebley Internship Program, he created opportunities for young journalists that may not have existed. He was a treasure of a person, and he will be missed. So we're, the way this is going to work logistically is, um, I believe uh, you're all going to have some uh, index cards and pencils. So as questions occur to you, 
Um, please jot them down. You can write who you are if you want. And then Josie and Mark will collect them and bring them to me. And we're only doing that. We're pretty, you know, relatively small, but it gets to more of them that way. Trust me. And I also want to extend a special thanks to Emily Hansel, um, who uh, helped us put this all together. She's a spectacular Stanford student and research assistant and has been working closely with me over the last few months. <laughs> so in alphabetical order, immediately to my left, Leroy Chapman Jr. is the Atlanta Journal-Constitution's editor-in-chief. Previously, he was the managing editor, where he was in charge of reporting teams that cover state, local, and federal government, politics, education, public safety, courts, transportation, basically everything. And he's been there since 2011. Leanne Colasiopo is the editor of the Denver Post, a position she's held since 2016. Her first job at the Post was in 1999 as an assistant city editor. And since then, she's held several editing positions, including investigations editor and news director. She previously worked at the Des Moines Register, the Greenville News and Kingsport Times News in Tennessee. Finally, Julie Mackinnon, editor-in-chief of the San Francisco Standard. Uh, Julie has more than two decades of experience as a writer, an editor, a foreign correspondent for the LA Times, the Washington Post, the New York Times, and others. She served as executive director of the Desert Sun in Palm Springs um, and as an editor, California editor for the USA Today Network. It's a bit of a homecoming for her since Julie was a JSK journalism fellow and a staff member of the Stanford Graduate School of Business's Center for Entrepreneurial Studies. So please join me in thanking our panelists for coming out tonight. So to kick us off, I'd like to start with sort of a broad question about how each of you see the magnitude of this problem of polarization and generally how it impacts your work. Leroy, you want to begin? Sure, uh, I can start. So uh, we've spent years saying that uh, with the rise of social media especially that uh, and also the decline, I think, of newsrooms. So uh, newspapers like the ones that I grew up in and even the one that I'm in now, which is a big city newspaper, have spent years managing decline, and we've done so at the same time you've had uh, the rise of social media. So this thing called the internet is this weird place where everyone speaks at once and everyone's both right and wrong at the same time. So how do you make sense of it? Uh, that's where we want to make sure that we're doing for the public. And our basic mission, of course, is to make sure that we uh, are attending to our duties to promote good citizenship. And that comes with being present. It comes with collecting facts. It comes with the basics of the people and the leaders who I entrust with leading a community. Are they who they say they are? Are they influenced by someone? And all the results, what they should be. And so those are the basic things. But the problem, of course, is that when everyone has a microphone, uh, even good intentions, even objective fact, even good investigative reporting, and I'm sure someone who's been an investigative editor can tell you that you can spend months and months and months writing something that's an investigative piece. Uh, but you will lose control of it like almost immediately because it will go to the digital, it will go to the ecosystem now that exists uh, with information and those things will be hotly debated and then there will pe be people who are not the, uh, uh, who are bad actors, I will, I will just put it at that, put it at that um, who not only will dispute you, but maybe even make things up about why uh, we are not credible sources of information. And then to add to that, there's of course the uh, AI and bad actors who now have access to powerful tools to promote whatever they want to promote. And those folks um, sometimes do not have our best interests and sometimes they're, not even, they're even foreign interests. So, it's a complicated stew of things that we have to deal with. But in a place like Georgia, where we matter because of what's happening, I'm sure some of you have probably heard that there's a lot going on in Georgia, right? <laughs> <laughs> there's this former president who is now uh, defending himself in court. Uh, and also, it's gonna be an election in November. And the last time there was an election where he was on the ballot, he contested uh, the results and tried very hard to make an argument. Some say tried too hard even in a way that might be criminal <laughs> to dispute the results. So uh, we understand that that's gonna happen again. So the stakes are high. The playing field is unlike anything that we've seen. 
And we, when Joy Mayer says that um, our democracy and citizenship depends on it, that is not an overstatement. So a collection of objective fact is critical. And that's the landscape that we're in right now. Yeah, when we were conceiving this panel, I said we have to have Georgia. No escaping <laughs> that. Leanne, yes. you want to? Yeah, I don't want to, um, I'll avoid repeating what he said, because I agree. I agree. Um, I would, I guess the only thing I would add to that is um, there's a spiral that comes when there's a lack of trust um, um, in, your, in your organization. And it takes the effect of um, if people don't, um, if leaders are going to pretend that you're, uh, that you're not trustworthy, then they pretty soon quit wanting to talk to you. When, they, when you can't have um, an honest um, dialogue um, with, the, with the, um, all parts of the community, then your reporting does begin to suffer. Then they can point to your reporting and say, see, they didn't include these viewpoints. And you end up in this uh, race to the bottom um, that I think we have um, seen appear at some times. Um, so that is the, that's kind of the main point I would add to uh, his otherwise exactly dead on. Uh, <laughs> our future depends on it, as does our, our community's ability to be informed voters, and so it's critical. So before we bring Julie into the conversation, just can you just elaborate, Liam, though, on that race to the bottom? And everybody's a journalism expert now and a critic. How do you deal with the angry masses who think they know better? Um, well, that I would say that that's an area where we could improve, right? We, mm -hmm. I think that um, as we think about ways to start to build that trust, I was talking to our politics team um, actually just a couple weeks ago, and we were discussing, partly because of this, this panel, but um, looking into some of the things that we could do better. And one of them had to do with um, appearing on talk radio as a place, you know, that that conservative talk radio is a, or, or all talk radio can be a place where you can reach folks who are maybe not tuning into your own work in the traditional way. And the team was saying, I don't like to do it because it's scary <laughs> and it can be demoralizing. And we were agreeing that probably we need to get back into that um, get back into that more and be more willing to go out um, and speak about what we're doing and defend what we're doing and um, advocate for our work to um, help uh, set the stage that we are um, actual people, reporters who can explain their work um, and can talk about what we're doing in, a, in an honest and, and meaningful way um, as one way to sort of combat uh, that whole angry masses and we you do see it you do can see it kind of work like you can see people going in and um, talking to a, a, a hostile radio uh, show and then you um, explain well actually it was this and, and we framed it we framed the story up this way for this reason and if you can explain yourself and, and offer that level of transparency into the way you approached your work it, it can really help. That's wonderful. I want to come back to the transparency section because that's a big part of this. Go ahead, Julie, how you see all this. Um, I agree with a lot of um, what you both have said. In my recent experience has been in maybe communities where the political situation was a little bit um, less intense, I think, and, and maybe actually turned a little bit upside down. I mean, Palm Springs is quite a liberal community. Um, the wider Coachella Valley has some conservative people, but it's generally purple and there's not a lot of um, fringe uh, viewpoints. Uh, so, uh, but I think the issue there was um, the lack of trust came from just the erosion of the local media through corporate ownership and, uh, you know, a, a paper that once rivaled the LA Times in size had shrunk uh, quite considerably. So there were reasons of distrust uh, for things kind of beyond the rise of the internet and social media, but some of the economic realities of declining legacy news. Um, and then, you know, in San Francisco, where I am now, it's almost sort of the inverse world. <laughs> you know, we have liberals and more liberals. <laughs> so, um, but there can be trust in those, in those communities as well. It's not just limited to, you know, red, blue. Right, it's not only, um, I mean, there's, but there's ends, there's ends to this on the liberal side and the conservative side. So I wanna come back to that. Next thing I wanna do is sort of define what's possible. 
right? I really want to, we're going to achieve something tonight. We're not only mulling the problem. And uh, it struck me, Leanne, when I spoke to you before the panel that you talked about not chasing around an audience that is lost for us. So can you just, Leanne, and then the rest, um, who do you mean? Like, who's lost? How do we define who's lost and who can still be held on to and retained? Reach that maybe is a little lost. I think that, um, unfortunately, uh, we have reached a point where there is a segment of the population that is um, so turned off from legacy news that I don't know what could bring them back. Um, and, they t and they tend to represent, um, like so often the people you hear from tend to represent the extremes. Um, and that there's a, a, a value in us recognizing um, that that's just, that there's just a stark hard reality about that. And that step one to me is not trying to chase after that, um, that unlikely outcome, <laughs> but to recognize that there's still people who are um, news consumers, maybe not regular news consumers, are more in the middle. They're, they're not the folks that we necessarily hear from screaming at us, but we need to uh, make sure that we are finding ways to um, reach out to them to hear them, so we keep them in the news fold and don't make this problem worse than it already is. Um, so finding meaningful ways to make sure that you're soliciting feedback um, by, I don't know, I wasn't a fan of really killing comments on our stories, as awful as they were, um, because I did think it gave a place for people who were angry about stories to have an easy way to respond to us and at least feel like they were getting it off their chest. And for us, if we wanted to delve in there, which we did, or I did, um, to kind of read some of the viewpoints and, and see, wow, this might have been a blind spot for us in the story. This might have been um, language and a headline that wasn't as precise as it should have been. This story, maybe the framing up of this wasn't quite right. You could sort of start to see those things. So finding ways that we can solicit that kind of feedback would be, um, would be one example of trying to work with the folks who are um, at least um, to some extent engaged with the news, even if it makes them angry for reasons that um, uh, as a person who's helping produce the news doesn't think is right, that you're, you're keeping that conversation open. So just to put a finer point on it, if you're like a QAnon conspiracy theorist person, who just won't even read you. Like, you're not gonna go after that person. But if you're someone who posts angry comments, or used to, before you shut it down, you're gonna try and reach those people. I think that we have a better shot at those people. Mm -hmm. And those people are very important. We don't wanna make this worse, right? Mm -hmm. And I, um, I would love to get the QAnon person. I really would. I'm just not sure it's realistic right now. Okay. Um, and, um, but I think the person who is angry and is um, takes the time, takes the time to email me um, every couple of weeks to complain about something. Those kind of people, um, they're, they're still engaged in some way. They still want news to succeed. And, and for us, and, and I will just say that m while we do get people on the far left also complaining, that's not our number one source of complaints. It's, it tends to be further to the right. Um, and our editorial page tends to lean a little further to the left. So trying to um, just make sure that as a mainstream me news organization, we are um, finding a way to speak to the um, entirety of our population matters. Leroy, how do you see this? Who's reachable, who's not? We, um, at the AJC, we poll, um, and we do so because we obviously are a swing state. Uh, we do a lot of polling, and I think we're gonna do seven this year. Uh, but there are some things we can track, and there's a question we've been asking repeatedly about uh, trust in the 2020 election cycle. Uh, when you have consistently one third of people who think that Joe Biden did not win the election, and these are poll that's polling of likely Georgia voters, um, those people probably aren't folks we're going to get because we're writing about what's been happening in our courts, what's been happening in, at our county election offices, all the things to say that this is what actually happened. And all of our leaders in Georgia who administer those things, and every judge who has rejected every, every single uh, complaint which argued otherwise. So that's an example of folks that perhaps we won't get. And that's a large percentage of the electorate when you think about that, uh, that's a lot of folks. So we, we aren't gonna be the mass media that we were. 
but here's what we can be. And here's what we at the AJC concentrate on. Uh, number one, uh, our customer is a customer who's gonna pay for news <laughs> because we are a subscription business. Therefore, uh, there are lots of folks who want their information for free. Well, they won't be our customers anyway. But here's the thing, though. If we make the right case about us being a dependable, reliable source of objective fact, that we are embedded in communities, and one of the things that we can that will make people gettable is that we're making a concerted effort to show up. Uh, I have, I've been in this job almost a year, and I basically have spent the entire time going and accepting any invitation I get, just about, <laughs> that I can go to. So I'm standing up, I'm, I'm in front of folks, and let me tell you what happens. When they are told that media are the enemy of the people, and I talk to them about, I'm a dad, I've got kids in public schools, uh, I'm your neighbor, I drive a Toyota. I mean, I, I don't know if that's media elite, but <laughs> no, I, I drive a Toyota. <laughs> and I've always driven Toyotas. Uh, so it, it, what it will do is people will connect. And I think that's the thing. There's a community of those folks who really care about what's happening. And those are the folks that are good. Well, we'll start there. But here's the thing that happens too, though. And I think that we, you know, Joy Meyer with, with Trusting News, uh, we've partnered with them too. And here's something that is a benefit of having these people, that, that core group that is gonna pay, but also who depend on you, is that in those places that people are arguing about what's going on, if you arm those folks because they're engaged with you with fact, they'll stick up for you. They'll advocate for you. They'll speak in places where you aren't. <laughs> then they'll say, no, this is, this is true. I'm sorry, where did you hear that? And they will talk about the quality of information in a way that actually is helpful. So when you start seeing some of that, and we cut the comments off too, but we see some of that in social media where there is more of that, where people are pushing back and you get a little bit of that. So, so that's, that's, that's who's gettable. And, and just one more thing real quickly is that I got this email today. <laughs> uh, so unfortunately we had a, a terrible, terrible thing that happened in our country where we lost three service people. They all happen to be from Georgia. Uh, because they were part of a National Guard unit. Um, and so I got this, this note. Dear Mr. Chapman, thank you for the story about this tragic event involving Georgia reservists serving in the Middle East. I must confess that I am perplexed by the fact that the article referenced individuals being quoted by their official titles in all but one instance. President Joe Biden was simply referenced as Joe Biden. While everyone should know who he is, it seems disrespectful to the president and could be viewed as putting a thumb on the scale that should not be put on the scale. Now, there's nothing there we intended to do, right? So what do, we, what do you do in that sense? You email that guy back and you say, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your feedback. Thank you for your feedback. So being able to have a connection with your community, is, it, that's gonna sustain us. So being able to send a note back to this gentleman and say thank you for that was an oversight. And I can add president online. He read us online this morning. Easiest thing to be to do is correct it and to, and to thank this gentleman for pointing this out. So part of this whole exercise of trust is being able to connect. And I know with managing decline, uh, oftentimes it was just enough to keep the lights on. But at a certain point, though, we have to be in our communities, be present, and we have to communicate with people. I just love that example because as someone who reported on the Middle East for a very long time, and I used to get a lot of hate mail. And, um, but the way I would decide who I'd respond to was someone who actually had some kind of comment that, that was rooted in reality that you could actually address. And I would always say, thank you for your feedback. And, and as angry as they were, once you responded, it was so disarming. It's just so much harder in the social media age when people are flinging stuff online all the time. Julie, how do you see this? Do you think um, some people are just not reachable in some communities or? Everybody's reachable? Um, no, I don't think everybody's reachable. <laughs> but I do think there's a big uh, group in the middle, and, and I found that in Palm Springs. You know, I had some people who were you know, more on the conservative side, but mostly they were just kind of upset about local issues and stuff. And um, I remember uh, they invited me to one of their community meetings, and someone in the news said, don't go to that. Those people are kind of... And I said, I'm definitely going because, um, I, A, I want to see for myself. B, 
be like the county sheriff was going and the county DA was going and like other reputable people were going. I mean, um, I might not agree with them on everything, but I was like, okay, I'm going to go and like engage with this group. And it was fine. And then those people started really engaging with the newspaper, like sending in letters to the editor and um, calling me up and giving me tips and stuff. And all I had to do was show up there once and they were plugged back to it, you know? And so um, I love that part of the job, going out and making those connections because uh, it's sort of incredible um, how people are m much, more well-behaved in person <laughs> um, and more willing to be reasonable. I mean, I don't know if it can be pr proven uh, with data, but you know, sort of the collapse in the news industry and the collapse in trust follow each other. And I, I always think it has to be in large part, not only because of all the bad things that are said about the press, not only because of social media, but just people don't know journalists as much as they used to. San Jose Mercury News used to have someone, right, covering every town in the peninsula. Now they gotta cover like, all the school boards of account, you know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. So being out there, what I'm hearing is definitely part of the solution. Another thing that's been touted as a solution is being more transparent. And we've looked at a couple of the ways that you can do that. But for all of you, um, maybe Leroy, I start, what, do you, what is the most important way that you're being more transparent at the Journal Constitution now? Is it in describing who the reporters are? Is it in explaining how you came up with the story? Is it in doing these engagement type things in the community? What, what is it? Uh, all uh, the above. It's all the above. And I think there's several things on the menu that uh, they require some time. Some of it requires money. And uh, those things are in short supply when you're in, in our business. But you have to do it. So in terms of explaining, you know, I mentioned how we poll. Well, we tell people, how we do the poll, who conducted it. Here's the methodology. We explain it in painstaking detail every single time so anyone who cares to uh, understand can. Uh, as you can imagine when you're talking about horse races, right? So this is who's leading the race for governor, who's leading the race for U.S. Senate, uh, who, who might be leading uh, in a hypothetical matchup right now for president. So people want to know, you know, are you oversampling Republicans? Are you... Are you undercounting this group or that group? Because you know, everyone's suspicious. They want to know whether or not you're putting a thumb on the scale. And we know that polling has a horrible reputation now because of some things that happened during 2016. And um, I'm proud to say that we didn't fall into that trap and our polling has been really doggone good. Um, but you know, we partner with the university. We have really good folks who do our polling. So it is being able to explain what we do. Getting out of the community is important as well. So we're doing more community groups, we're doing forums, we're bringing people in. Uh, we start with our subscribers, we bring people in who aren't our subscribers, and we take advantage of this. I mean, we have a unique ability to convene people. So we can convene people around common interest, then we can get people in and people hear from us. And when they sit down with our journalists, and that's the third thing you mentioned, um, they understand that if you talk about Georgian voting, well, we have a reporter who does nothing but that. His job every single day is to get up and think about voting in Georgia. And he is someone who has an encyclopedic knowledge of voting. <laughs> so as we write these stories about the lawsuits and about uh, everything that's tried to challenge the results, uh, he, that's his full-time job. And so when he talks about it and he's able to answer questions, he's able to do so with the kind of knowledge that only really one person has, who isn't probably an attorney, uh, he has it because in every case, he's had to become quite an expert on those things. So when we're able to show our own expertise and we're able to show our work as the trusting news folks, and I can't say enough about how, how good the trusting news folks are at saying, show your own work. Showing your own work sometimes means this is why we're covering this. So there are times, even things that you take for granted. I mean, obviously a newspaper is gonna cover an election. Well, you know, sometimes we'll do a page to say, here's what we're going to do for you. These are the issues. So we're going to cover these issues because these are the most important issues through our polling. It says these are the most important. So these are the issues you care about. These are the groups who are going to be decisive. And so if you look demographically and geographically, we're going to concentrate on these folks because they're going to be decisive. 
So being able to explain yourself and why you're doing something, what it will do is it'll diffuse all the arguments that this is you know, all a conspiracy between elites who only want to do this when you're able to explain yourself in that kind of detail. So do not, if you're in media, be afraid to just put in the work to say, here's what we're doing and why. Mm -hmm. Leanne, yeah. Um, yeah, we do the things that I think most, um, most newspapers are doing now around transparency, which is um, making it easy to see who the, who's writing the story, a little bit about their background, uh, try to be transparent about it. We, we are transparent about our mistakes <laughs> and um, you know how they happened. Um, uh, do a lot to, to make sure it's easy to find what our um, policies are, say around why we would use an anonymous source, including in the story, why we are using, why we've granted anonymity. Um, I've got many examples that um, I've um, declined um, to put an anonymous source in the story, just said it doesn't reach our standard. So we've brought that um, that way down. Um, but again, there's, there's folks who there's no transparency that's enough. Um, I had a guy the other day wanting to know, saying I needed to include how I'd voted in the, how I voted, uh, needed to be part of our biography. So <laughs> we're not going to include that, that we're just never going to do that. But in that person's mind, that was the level of, of transparency. And I was also reading, um, I was also reading a study that was looking at how some efforts at transparency can have the opposite effect of what you want. So that, and I've seen this some, like you are, you correct your mistake, you, you put it in a public place, right? Um, but to some folks, that's just highlighting how sloppy you were to begin with and why you should never have been trusted to begin with. Um, and, and similar um, with diversity, um, as you um, make public um, the, how diverse your staff is, uh, uh, generally seen as an important um, component of transparency about who's bringing you the news and, and, you know, are they all the same kind of people? There are folks who are like, um, you know, you, oh, see, you're liberal. You've made a point of hiring folks. So it can all. backfire, you're saying. So, so some of these efforts can backfire. Not that you shouldn't do them. I'm just showing you that some of the most obvious efforts can have unintended, um, unintended consequences. And I also wanted to hit, well, you may be getting to this, but mm -hmm. you were talking about how part of the issue then becomes there's fewer journalists out there mm -hmm. working. And so you don't have some of those um, some of those connections, which I would add makes it all the more important to be so thoughtful about what you are covering and who and how you're framing up those stories so that you're sure that with your more limited resources, you're doing the kind of work um, that will connect you to your audience with more um, things that relate to their lives, um, solutions-based um, reporting, reporting that isn't just all about covering the elite structure that just helps reinforce the idea that you are part of that elite structure because that's all you ever write about, which yeah. is a little off of transparency. But I just no, I want to come to that as well in terms of the story selection. What about in Palm Springs or in San Francisco? What's the level of transparency you need or any initiatives or things that you promote? Um, a lot of the same things that these folks have talked about, um, you know, biographies of our reporters on the site and um, uh, explaining certain stories, how they were reported, if they were extremely laborious or <laughs> convoluted <laughs> and how we, how we got there. But I think a lot of this stuff is becoming quite standard. Joy is a great evangelist for these things, and we've referenced her materials as well. One of the things that uh, you mentioned, Leanne, you sort of, I don't you sort of talked about, like when you just said, talked about um, story selections. Um, what do you do in horse race coverage? Obviously, we're in an election year, and I loathe horse race coverage. I loathe it. But it drives, people want, you know, it's, it's profitable, right? It's profitable. It, dries, it draws eyeballs. And Another thing that draws eyeballs are crazy things that, that extremist people say, right? You called it traffic gold when Lauren Boebert opens her mouth in Colorado, right? When, you, when we spoke. But then you had a realization about it. So talk a little bit about that balance. Yeah, it's always so, of course, Lauren Boebert is part of our, is part of our coverage area, the um, fiery congresswoman. Um, and she, um, she just opens... It, I mean, she just says all sorts of all sorts of things and does all sorts of things that you wouldn't necessarily have expected of a congresswoman, and so um, 
And we have, and that was our first encounter with really um, somebody, well, we had Tom Tancredo a while back, but this was really our first encounter with this. And in the beginning, um, we would like, if she said something, we'd be writing about it or, you know, even just throw up something quick and, and people were reading it and it, it did a lot of, it did a lot of web traffic for us. Um, but then you, one, one, you could have a full-time reporter who did nothing right, did nothing but that. And there's just so little journalistic value to it. There's just, sometimes there is, but sometimes there's just, it's just re, it's just amplifying, um, it's just amplifying what she was saying that was often hateful um, without appropriate context. So um, we just uh, dialed it back pretty quick. It didn't take us that long. I don't want to suggest we went on for months and months like that. We figured it out pretty fast that this wasn't, you know, this wasn't going to work. And so that we were, we would have more conversations about, is this worth it, is it not? If so, why? Like you're asking you the questions um, before you um, reported out um, what she said. Um, but there was backfire to that as well, this time from the left, which was that we were covering for her. Um, they would say that our owners, uh, that this was ownership, um, <coughs> Um, of the of the paper um, was obviously um, requiring us to not um, report on this kind of thing. Why aren't you? So um, that began that process once again, where you're trying to explain um, in some way, which I would probably say we didn't do particularly effectively. I don't know. We just didn't. We probably should have done better. Uh, there's always room to improve. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, so you do get the blowback either way. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a similar situation in Georgia. We do. We have a congresswoman whose name is Marjorie Taylor Greene. <laughs> I see some of you know who Marjorie Taylor Greene is. <laughs> so do I. About a year ago, um, in fact, uh, we, she sat at our table at the Congressional Correspondents' Dinner, and uh, I'd met her for the first time then. Well, Marjorie Taylor Greene, said in a dinner setting, is absolutely a delight to have dinner with, believe it or not. But I think she is exactly what we had a the AJC we hosted uh, Senator Joe Manchin uh, this past Friday, who, as you guys know, is flirting with the idea of a third party run, which is why he was in Georgia, which is why he was doing a town hall with us. But one of the things that he said as a someone who's been in um, Washington for a long time is that, well, here's the turn. Uh, the turn is that what we've got in D.C. is a pretty profitable business. And the shock, the sharp division, the confrontation, the noise is all very profitable. And so when you think about someone like uh, Congresswoman Green from my state of Georgia, uh, she raises a lot of money. And if you can monetize the Internet in this way, there's, there's really no disincentive for that. So is her method of monetizing the internet news? No, I mean, it doesn't really raise itself to news because it's just noise and it's the way she raises money among a bunch of folks. But does it have real impact on anything that's happening in Washington? Typically, no. But our standard was this, is that if some of this winds up having some impact, we'll write about it. I mean, we've got folks in DC uh, who cover our delegation and she is a member of our delegation. So we also want to hold her accountable for having to have uh, you know, those 700,000 folks that she represents back home. She owes them the things that a congressman owes them. So we cover her that way too. So while on the one hand, uh, we know that there is something that is for her and her political ambitions and herself individually uh, being an internet troll is beneficial to her. We're also framing this also around too, is she uh, an adequate congressperson? Is she doing what she was elected to do? And that's what our goal is. So, you know, yeah, it, it can be traffic goal, but, but, it, but it's got diminishing returns. And again, we're a subscription business. The people who pay for us, they're not paying for us to go and get what they can get on the internet and just repeat that. They'd much rather us go and write about whether or not Roger Taylor Greene or anyone else who is sworn in, who is elected and sworn in if they're doing their jobs. So what I'm hearing is when you have an extremist politician on the left or the right or anything who is an internet troll, as you described it, Leroy, um, you, you, you can ignore some of that 
internet trolliness um, and focus more on what they do, less than what they say. Right. Is that kind of a rule, you think? But, but on the other hand, they're elected members of Congress, so if they're saying something that's completely, you know, wackadoodle, like, you kind of have to hold them accountable, right? Lest you be accused, as you said, Leanne, of the opposite, of covering well, let for me, them. Let me, let me just at least give this perspective. So back in, was it 2009? There was a congressman who at a State of the Union stood up and President Barack Obama was giving the State of the Union address and he yelled, you lie. That congressman <laughs> was Congressman Wilson from South Carolina. I was at my house having dinner and I was like, God, I hope that's not one of ours. Of course it was Joe Wilson. <laughs> so it was one of ours. Joe Wilson got censored. I mean, he was, went through the whole thing. Well, what, what, what else happened? Joe Wilson raised more money that year than any other congressperson. So this is back during more of the infancy of social media in that way to be able to organize and raise money, right? Fast forward to now, <laughs> Marjorie Taylor Greene did the exact same thing to Joe Biden. And so here's the difference. Joe Wilson was afraid that he may lose his seat he got censured, he did all this stuff. Marjorie Taylor Greene showed up the next day at the Congressional Correspondents' Dinner. We thought she wasn't gonna show up, I mean, she did. I mean, for her, it was the, she was just doing business. And I think for us, we have to be aware that maybe our standards are lowering a bit with if someone can heckle the President of the United States during the State of the Union, which is exactly what happened. But it's, it's where we are. And so I don't necessarily have an answer to that other than if you've got finite resources and you are trying to figure out what to do, then you know, do you spend your time every day writing about the outrage of the day because the internet's successful? Or do you do the kind of reporting that can at least say, here's a scorecard of how you're doing your job and either you're doing it or you're not. And if you're spending your time doing this, how are you spending your time? Are you engaging with your community? Are you in the DC? Are you in mar a -Lago? Are you in Marietta? Mm -hmm. And so if you're not Marietta and you're in Mar-a-Lago, Mar that says something too. And we can report that. Those are tangible things. And not just that you use the microphone that every single person in this room has for, for, you, for yourself, essentially for self-gratification and for self-interest. Uh, we don't want to be a tool you know. of them, you know. Absolutely. Difficult choices. It's difficult choices. Yeah. Julia, do you have something to add on this? Otherwise, I'm going to shift to some other a major project of yours. Uh, yeah, no, I'm happy to talk about the major. So project. I want to shift the I want to shift the conversation a bit to editorials and opinions in the newspapers. And um, one of the grave consequences I think of the internet is that sometimes people have uh, trouble seeing the way they they don't have the signals they have of the paper newspaper to actually see the sections. But Julie, talk about um, the very interesting and successful intervention that you did when you were at the Desert Sun in terms of trying to use the editorial page to reduce polarization in that community. Yeah, so, um, you know, we started this conversation talking about maybe opinion, too much opinion was the problem. And um, when I got to Palm Springs, um, I realized maybe not enough opinion was the problem. So I, when I got to Palm Springs, we had an opinion page um, that largely um, had sort of syndicated national columnists, um, you know, mostly talking about, uh, I got there in 2018, so mostly talking about stuff inside the Beltway. Um, there'd be some local letters to the editor and we did have a editorial board that was composed, a majority of them were community members, um, but a lot of the space was given over to um, national politics. And I started looking at that and thinking, why are we doing this? There's so many places you can read this stuff, um, but there's not a lot of places where you can talk about what's going on with the schools in Palm Springs, or should we really put up that giant statue of Marilyn Monroe in the center of town at the cost of a million dollars or not? Um, by the way, her butt was like facing the art museum and people at the art museum were upset about it and it was a great Palm Springs story. So, um, and I was thinking about this because I had read some research from some folks who said, um, that when like a news desert opens up, people don't stop consuming news, they just kind of consume national news instead of local news, and then they bring that polarization 
back into their communities. And that was just really depressing to me. Um, so I was looking at the editorial page. And at that time, I luckily had an opinion page editor. And I said, hey, Al, like, I think we got to stop doing this national stuff. And I think we got to make the opinion pages all about what's going on here in the community. Because I think there's a lot for people to agree on that is, you know, if we take it a take the arguments away from what's happening inside the beltway and talk about you know the street that needs to be paved the speed limit here that maybe needs to be lowered or raised this bridge that needs to be built what's going on with the Marilyn Monroe statue um, people then are not in the same tribes you, I don't know is Marilyn Monroe statue a Democrat or Republican <laughs> issue um, you know the Local politics can make for strange bedfellows. So um, we decided to have a, a month-long vacation from national politics on our opinion page. And I wrote a column saying we were going to do this. My opinion editor was very afraid because he's like, how are we going to fill it? So mm -hmm. I was like, well, <laughs> I said, Al, I'll, I'll write a column and I'll try to like drum up some stuff, you know. So I wrote about this um, and we started kind of banking some things. But in the meantime, the social scientists who I had read their initial report reached out to me and they said, oh, this is so interesting. Uh, we want to study this. Um, uh, how might we do that? And so we got to talking and I said, well, I have this other newspaper that I also oversee, which was in Ventura County. Very similar size, the Ventura County Star also had an opinion page daily. Um, also was doing a lot of national stuff on it. And I said, um, well, they're not going to do this experiment. We're going to do this. And you can, uh, there can be a control group. So uh, they did some public, they did some polling before our experiment in both Palm Springs and in Ventura. And then after the month long experiment, um, they did some more polling. Um, and it was very gratifying because they found that polarization like continued to go up in Ventura and in Palm Springs it was uh, trending downward. Um, so that was really uh, sent a good signal to us that we were on the right track. It also just made the paper a lot more interesting and it brought so many new people into the newspaper and gave them a a voice in um, what we were reporting on. And that became sort of a flywheel for bringing a lot more local voices into our pages. So um, I, I, I am a contrarian saying that opinion is the problem. I think too, too, much, too little opinion could be the problem too. And um, really, focusing on local issues and opinion pages can make the tent of your audience bigger. Another solution, see what promised. <laughs> get Leroy, go ahead. Mm -hmm. so, so too little opinion, I, I, I certainly agree with that. And I just wanna bring it back to something else. So with the Marjorie Ta Taylor Greene sort of, well, if you've got good opinion people, that's a great place to do what opinion writers can do, right? They can express outrage, they can talk about you know, what our standards should be, what's aspirational for society. And they can put a lot of that where you don't spend news reporter time covering something that's really not news anymore after the first dozen times you do something just for the sole sake, sake of shock value, right? So opinion is important in that way. Um, the other thing that I just wanna say too that we're doing uh, at the AJC is we're, we're borrowing some of that playbook. Uh, we've got lined up this year some contributors, people who have been uh, elected officials, some other folks, we're looking at the spectrum, and we are, instead of having national voices on our pa local pages talking about things that are happening in D.C. <laughs> that often do nothing but, uh, I mean, they're like shouting matches on, on paper, on newsprint. We, we don't need that. I think that the perspective of people who we have lined up, for example, uh, one is a former congresswoman. Uh, the other uh, is someone who was uh, the commission chairman of Fulton County, Georgia, which of course is in the news and it's important and they're hiring, well hiring, <laughs> they're electing new leadership <laughs> uh, this, this session. So in Georgia, uh, basically the uh, election is the presidential election. 
there's very little in between, and it then goes down to the county level. And so being able to bring people down who can really speak locally about the folks who we're electing is important. So opinion is important there. Now we don't endorse, we don't do that sort of thing. Uh, we kind of got out of the endorsement business, but but I think we're able to, to, to double down on some things that newspapers should do. Uh, we did hire a reporter whose job is more of an investigative job in politics, and they will be following the money and vetting the people. So having to, to shore up that, because our investigative team used to sort of do that during election season and kind of do it, and they really wanted to be doing something else. Well, hiring someone whose job it is to, is to do that uh, certainly is going to help as well. So, so those are kinds of things we can do as a trust building exercise to say, well, you can depend on us. Uh, it's funny, going back to Marjorie Taylor Greene, there were people who were like, well, we didn't know before she got elected. We were like, well, we tried to tell you. I mean, we really did. I mean, this is not a surprise, but you know, where she ran, what our, how our election maps look, and um, they keep getting redrawn to look the same way. I mean, part of that is all of the issue too with polarization is because our maps uh, lean in to, to party advantage to a point where there are no competitive races. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have such extremes on either side too. So this is not just, I know sometimes the loudest voices are on, on, can be on one side, but they're on, it's on both sides. But just a point of clarity here, Leroy, when you say you got out of the endorsement business, mm -hmm. that's on the presidential or you don't endorse at any level? We don't endorse at any level Neither anymore. Neither do we. Yeah. Neither do you? So, yeah, we got in, but, So just to, to be clear, and I am someone who was on editorial page a long time ago, and we would take pride in spending time with every person on the ballot and giving our opinion on who you should vote for. And we don't do that anymore. And, and we're sort of in an environment now where People want to make their own decisions, but people now can can put if you can if they can put their hands on the right information, they'll make their own decisions. So give them a, a quality voter guide and let them decide. Absolutely. Yeah. Leanne, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, uh, some, uh, same. We'll um, endorse on to um, to her point on local issues, um, or this is how we'll be doing it moving forward. Um, so we might endorse on a tax, or we might make a recommendation on a tax issue. Um, but if there's people. Um, Mostly it's just, it's more divisive was our conclusion than it was helpful. So you can write up the issues leading up to the election. This is what we think about. This is where these people stand or so-and-so stands on say some big environmental thing or um, any number of local issues, but we will, we bring it back toward writing about um, our local issues and how different people come in on them or how we think the thinking should be around something like water quality, air quality, whatever it might be, um, but not, we don't get down to vote, on, vote for this person. The Julie, what are you doing at the Standard or in, in what do you do in Palm Springs on endorsements? Um, well, at the Standard, we just launched opinion content um, last week. <laughs> so <laughs> have a we, chance to make it new. We've published like four pieces so far. <laughs> we, don't, um, we don't have any immediate plans to publish any sort of house editorials. It's all just guest uh, opinions right now. Um, so we're feeling our way forward on that. In Palm Springs, it was much more traditional. We did uh, do endorsements. The, um, the editorial board we had was a majority of community members rather than people from the newspaper. So um, they felt it was important. Um, and uh, it was actually kind of an interesting um, exercise in... Uh, I won't say like wielding the paper's power, but it did, um, it caused those people running for office or the um, incumbents and challengers to engage with us. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it made, uh, I, I think it uh, was a touch point for them to um, know that they were gonna have to deal with us <laughs> one way or another. Um, I was really careful to try to make that process as fair as possible and um, as clear to them as possible. So everyone felt that they got a fair shake whether or not we ended up endorsing them or not so that it was a positive uh, experience dealing with the Desert Sun and knowing that 
we, this is a conversation that was going to continue, you know, with them. Um, so uh, I know it's not for every market. It was right for our market. We did not do presidential endorsements. We just kept to the local stuff and state propositions, which are crazy and hard to understand. So and I guess, like, as we were saying about transparency, so long as you explain your reasoning on this to people and they understand it and they're not left guessing, you can could, you could make a decision. And I hope people who are watching this now or who watch it later on video just appreciate that just how difficult these choices can be, how you cover certain people, what you cover, how you write about it, whether to endorse, whether or not, like it's a very serious business. I wanna ask a question about who gets to tell the story. A couple of years ago, we did an event here on uh, reporting for or reporting about the poor um, that um, Professor Hamilton um, arranged and organized and initiated and it was a good event. And I asked a question of one of the panelists that stuck with me till now. I said to her, I said, could I go into inner city Detroit and spend a month there and do a story about poverty in that community? Uh, would, that, would you be okay with that? And she said no. And, um, and what she was saying was that you needed to be of the community in order to actually report it. Now, I've had opposite criticism from people that if you're of the community, then you can't do it objectively, right? But if we're talking now about polarization and trust, how do you all see that? Do you, I mean, is it better, should we have more diversity in the newsrooms in terms of uh, more conservative voices, more people from other states, you know, than New York and Cal you know, California? You know, do, what kind of diversity do we need? And, and this question of who gets to tell the story. Leroy, what do you think? So uh, it's a thorny issue, right? Uh, because that pendulum can swing both ways. Uh, I was a reporter, you know, I'm 52. So when I got into this business, that's 30 years ago thereabouts. And uh, early on, I was a business reporter. And I would walk into um, places. I remember there's a bank I covered, uh, Sonovus Bank, and they had their regional meeting. And I went to their regional meeting. And but for, it was a breakfast. And but for the folks serving the food, I was the only person of color there. And there's, I know, 200 people in that room. And so um, I don't want to, because an editor could have said, if I want you to go cover the banking industry and really cover it from the inside, I gotta get someone who looks like those folks and talks like those folks. That would have been awfully limiting to me as someone who did not look like them and had to learn how to talk like them. So, so I understand the impulse too, especially when you talk about things like uh, you know, poverty because uh, there are certain communities where uh, media has not had the best relationship and has sometimes not represented people in a way that's fair or a way that's really useful to the people who are there. Uh, I've seen that. I've been outraged by that too. I mean, especially when you're talking about covering our cities. I mean, there's a narrative now among some who want to advance the notion that America's cities are burning to the ground, that they're just places where uh, there's chaos and disorder because there's a narrative. And that narrative sometimes is very much race-based because of you know, we get in Atlanta, they get in Detroit, they get in Baltimore, get in New Orleans, places where, where you know, African Americans are in charge. So I say all that just to say that uh, it's a thorny thing, it swings both ways, but I think the answer to that always is hiring the best people. And I think the best journalists are at home wherever. The best journalists will earn trust. And some of our best work that we've done in very black Atlanta has been white reporters in communities, in fact, we had uh, two, three white reporters who teamed up and we won an award from the National Association of Black Journalists uh, and it was uh, called Dangerous Dwellings. And this was about how in Georgia, because of our lax laws, that essentially you could, you, there's no incentive for a slumlord to ever fix anything. And we told the story and these people entrusted these white reporters who, who work, for, work for us, work for me, uh, they went to those communities and told their stories. They told the stories of the crime, of you know, the plumbing that would back up and fill their, their homes with raw sewage, that sort of thing. Uh, no recourse, not able to be able to, to get anyone to fix anything and they had to pay and if they didn't, uh, it was very easy in Georgia for them to have evictions on their record. If you got an eviction, you almost can't rent anything anymore. Those were white reporters who went out and told those stories of those black people. So really it's about the professionalism of the journalist and the commitment of the organization to be able to do right by everybody. 
All right. Um, I wanted to get some of the great questions that have been coming in. I have one from um, Elias, one of my students in COM 104. On top of rapid replying, what other communal channels of the internet could you use to enhance the connections you have with your audience? Like subreddits, Discord channels, something, you know, anything else beyond sort of replying in the comments or replying via email? Have you, has anybody explored anything? We may have some suggestions. We, we, um, we had an experiment at the Standard where um, we had a text messaging service and um, we were translating some of our articles into um, Chinese. San Francisco has a huge Chinese speaking population and uh, we would translate the articles and then kind of let this email subscriber list know, or the text message subscriber list know that we were, we had an article ready to read because like our website's in English. Um, so there was no sort of need as a Chinese speaker to come there every day. But it, when we did put up a Chinese article, we were doing, um, we were experimenting with that. We're, we're no longer doing that, but I, I do think text messaging is an interesting, um, you know, almost retro <laughs> way to engage with people now, but it is very immediate and it's very personal. Um, and um, we're talking about whether there's a, more to do in that realm. So Julie, like a WhatsApp group, we don't use WhatsApp in the US for some reason, everywhere else in the world they do. We're like um, text message, like sign up for a conversation, like make it two way, you know, yeah. have someone monitor that. Yeah. This is a question I love. I don't know who wrote this. I hope it was one of my students. Um, in our polarized world, journalists receive more hate mail and threats of violence against them. What kind of support or guidance do you provide reporters in your newsrooms when they're in, you know, fight, facing this kind of threat? A sore Again. point. <laughs> I'm a sore, that's just a sore point. It's, um, I mean, I had to have the police out not too long ago to my house um, after a guy described the front of my house and said that next there's some rocks out there. Next time you see one of those rocks, look for an extra rock. It's me hiding there waiting for you. And um, how did he convey that sweet message to you? Oh, he called. Oh. Yeah, he called to tell me. And um, so now as it happened with him, the police listened, <laughs> the police listened to the voice and like, oh, we know him. Oh. It was one of those. Oh, so, okay. uh, he left a message. He left a message. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, he kind of, he rotates through lots of phones. He used kind of burner phones. You couldn't check him that way, but he, they knew his voice. So that was that. Uh, we are actually um, gearing up right now. I have, I've just been frustrated um, in our inability to really help um, reporters in a meaningful way. Um, the advice we'll get has been um, like, well, just have them um, not look at social media. since so Who much said that? Who said that? Um, oh, that would come from like HR, that kind of stuff. Oh, no, no, no. Um, so that's not helpful. And, um, or um, send all their, they can, um, you know, just don't open these emails. But we, you need to know, first of all, we need to know what's being said, right? Um, so how to adequately, um, how to adequately support them. I think um, a Tribune, which is a sister, or part of our company, a sister, close, a close cousin, to, to us um, has some pretty effective, has put in some effective things where they've got a, uh, an expert who will review your, um, your emails. Um, they can set up so that emails from a certain person always go to this guy and he says he will always review them so that you don't necessarily have to see him, but you know a human yes. has actually looked at them to look who's an expert in, um, in threats and that kind of stuff is actually looking at them to um, assess. Um, to assess what's going on. Um, we have definitely encouraged our staff to back off from Twitter. Um, that used to even be part of our job evaluations was are you engaging with people on social media? We've removed that completely from our job descriptions. It's, it doesn't drive much traffic for us. It's not particularly useful. We, we um, have been more intentional in saying just what that platform can be when it's toxic like that, feel free, feel free to back away. Um, but trying to um, counteract what that does, especially to our younger reporters um, who haven't had the years of um, kind of building their confidence um, to, 
um, to just be harassed. And it, it happens to our, um, it definitely happens to our women more than the men. And it happens to our reporters of color more than, than our white reporters. We had a woman who covered the NFL, covered the Broncos for us. That poor woman, she was just... I mean, forget politics. You should see sports, right? They're just <laughs> ravaged. Why aren't you home? She um, was Indian. Why aren't you home and doing this or go back to your country? Uh, like, really all the things that you can't imagine or you can't imagine. Um, and I, I, think, um, I think the um, sort of um, part where to make those reporters feel safe in their space um, is um, a big important area that... Um, is not adequately addressed. Well, it sounds like the Denver Post is coming up with a digital safety protocol, though, for journalists, which I think should be mandatory in every newsroom at this point. Yeah. Leroy, you have something similar in Atlanta? We do, but um, I, I tell you what accelerated us is this, is that 2020, during all of the unrest, uh, some of it visited Atlanta, and one of the things we did is that uh, we used to have we used to be part of Cox Media Group, and Cox Media Group was us, some more newspapers, a bunch of TV stations and radio. And the TV folks are a little bit more advanced when it comes down to this because they've got people who are on broadcast, their personalities, uh, they you know, are certainly uh, television, and I love this about the metabolism of TV, right? They're, they're there, they have to have a live shot, they have to be there. If there's a some news happening anywhere, they go. Well. You know, we've seen exactly what uh, what's, what can happen in that situation. We lost, uh, in fact, in Orlando, we lost uh, we lost um, uh, two uh, two journalists on air, essentially. So, so that's a dangerous thing. Now they've been ahead of us. So what we did is we uh, worked with some of the same security people for our folks uh, to understand and 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 sometimes have a somewhat security with them. Uh, so when we knew that there was, especially after January 6, 2, so when that happened, there was an expectation that uh, we could have more protest. It could potentially be violent. So what it's taken is some investment. And uh, fortunately, with uh, being owned by Cox, we've got the resources and we have already have a security apparatus that we can touch. But I think the other thing, too, uh, just beyond having to be in places like a protest, uh, having to go to a Trump rally, that, that would became a, another place, too, where our folks would be confronted. So it was Trump and Herschel Walker ran in Georgia. Uh, he basically was running off of kind of a, the Trump endorsement. So some of the same people would show up. And um, I would have, especially, you're right, uh, the women who would go cover I had to be concerned about. And we you know, had situations sometimes, too, where we uh, would have security. So it is a, a, it's a real thing uh, in terms of what happens online, I mean, having a professional look at things that might be concerning, we've got a process. If there's anything that you ever get that's concerning, you es escalate it and we've got a process to be able to vet it and to also be able to find people. And the good thing with Cox Security is that they work very closely with law enforcement uh, to be able to assess a threat. And we've had situations too, and I, it just breaks my heart to hear that someone called you to threaten you in that way. Uh, and we've had reporters who've also had something similar. You know, it's just so distressing for me as someone who covered a lot of war and conflict and, you know, experienced like physical risk in my career. And I, I, I think, you know, Georgia 2020 rallies equally dangerous, maybe more in some ways now. I mean, now that journalists are really being targeted. And so we're asking you know, my young reporters that I'm training here. Uh, to go into newsrooms to do this, and then they run the risk of p potentially being harassed online, even worse, maybe threatened at home. And they got to do all this extra stuff on transparency and all this stuff, as my student Aaron Edwards is pointing out, right? How are they going to make a living doing all this? And, and trying to figure yeah. out and make it so that you don't scare people out of the business. Well, that's right. I'm trying they to I give the happy talk wanted. here, as any of my students know, right? I say it's the greatest job on the planet. But now we're painting this scary picture. And you got to make money amid all the consolidation in the news business and the firings we had these last two weeks. So how do we, how do we get these best people to do this incredibly difficult job? It is the greatest job. I know. See, I'm not lying when I say it. But it's <laughs> there, is, there is nothing more rewarding than doing what we do. And, and I'll, I'll just say this, I mean, it is, um, we, we're on the front lines. Certainly sometimes there's risk to it, uh, but there's a tremendous reward 
and the reward is sometimes personal. Uh, so I talk about all these things, but I took this job uh, more than a year, well, almost a year ago, I should say, wouldn't more than a year because it'll be a year next, in, in March. So I became the first black editor at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution in 155 years. So publication that goes all the way back there, I was the very first person of color to run the newsroom, right? And so that's the other side of it too. People have been incredibly gracious. Now, did I get an email that said, um, you know, congratulations on being the affirmative action hire and I want to meet the white man whose job you took? Yes, I got that email. <laughs> but also, I got people who wanted to talk, a few wanted to vent, some wanted to celebrate. But, but in, in all of it, what, what the reward personally was this, is that we matter. And there are a lot of folks who are depending on us because they care about the things that we care about and they want us to do what we can do in convening people and being able to you know, have a conversation that's based on fact, to be able to dig deep, to be able to tell them about the, their leaders who they elect, you know, what's influencing them, how, have, how, how good or how bad have they done their jobs and, and where our communities might be failing. So a, a community like, like um, Atlanta, a state like Georgia can rally around some of those things because there are places where we are coming up short. And so being able to do things like put together um, things that change the law. Uh, we had a podcast that we did that we have gotten two people exonerated uh, who were wrongfully imprisoned. So we did that with podcast. Um, this past year, <laughs> we've, uh, we, we put together a documentary film. Now, I gotta tell you, it was a very cool moment when on a big screen, I saw Leroy Chapman, executive producer, <laughs> for a film, and this was this. I have this an is, Emmy. See, there you go. <laughs> and we, we, we have three, but I got. <laughs> a little competition going here. But, but, uh, but to, 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 to your point, it is that sort of thing too, right? Because these jobs are kind of what we make them because the, the person who had our jobs 10 years ago, 15 years ago, certainly 30 years ago, they weren't doing, doing films, were they? No, they weren't doing, we did a full length documentary film on hip hop in Atlanta, you know, the 50th sort of, so we do this film and we get all of these folks who were just great, they were grateful that we told an Atlanta story to Atlanta. So to be able to do that and have them come and attend and for them to, it was a sing along. You had these artists who became teenagers again and it was a sing along and they just loved the idea of the fact that someone you know, took the time to tell Atlanta's story. And it was a fantastic moment. So all I'm saying is this, is that there are things that are w where we matter in the community and no one else can do what we do. And there's a big reward for that. So while we've got all this other stuff, uh, I wouldn't trade it. And then I'll just say this, you will never lose the cocktail party because your stories are gonna be better than everybody else's stories, trust me. It's true, <laughs> you are the most interesting person in the room. Final thoughts, Julie or Leanne on maybe to encourage them to I, I go into this crazy business. I would say it, it does come back to what the point, to the um, theme here, which is that um, we need to matter. Mm -hmm. and, um, and when we matter, that's when people turn back and, and trust us, right? And, and that's what we're trying to get to is, to, is to get past that as you did with the, with the editorials to find, to make yourself you know, matter in that community about those, about those things or as, as you did um, with the films and, and connect to your community. And I think that um, as we think about how to um, make our communities turn to us, um, we can't stop the polarization at the national level. Realistically, you're in Denver, sitting in my little um, back bedroom at home, working away. Like I can't fix that. But what I can fix or can try to fix is making sure that um, at the Denver Post, when we're deciding how, what we're going to cover and how we're going to cover it, that we're doing it in a way that makes us matter in the community and make sure that. Um, readers need us to live their lives in a better way, to make their lives better. And to the extent that we make choices, um, that, that that just remains our thinking, I think that that is probably the biggest thing that um, local newspapers and small newspapers um, can do. And, it, and, and when I say it, it seems like, well, duh. But actually, when you're in the, in, the, in the middle of trying to make the decisions and you're moving so fast and you don't have enough resources, it's a lot easier sometimes to just go to the, um, 
I don't know, the story right in front of you, as opposed to thinking just a little bit about how can we turn that to make it more about fixing whatever this problem is or helping find a solution or making sure we talk to the person that, um, that brings that story back, um, back to the community and isn't just um, kind of vomiting out whatever that's kind of stenography news you can <laughs> use yeah. right um, mm -hmm. uh, that we're not just doing that but are taking the extra time um, to do those other kinds of stories because I, I feel like that the answer to a lot of this lies in that love that Julie last word here um, I guess for students I would say um, you know I, I started I was lucky to start my professional career at the Washington Post, and then I moved to the LA Times in f foreign news. I was a foreign correspondent. I worked overseas. Um, you know, and it was really only when I came to JSK and the 2016 election happened that um, I felt a calling to really um, turn to local news. I felt that there was something had happened in the country, and part of what it went wrong uh, was the demise of local news. And um, that has been a very rewarding um, place for me to be, perhaps even more so than some of the much more glamorous sounding titles that I previously <laughs> held because, you know, when I worked at the LA Times, no one came up to me in the grocery store and said, you local news lady <laughs> and they you know half the time I would just stand there and be like is this going to be good or is it going to be bad and it was it's like 50 50 but you know what like people gave a shit you know about what we were doing and that never happened to me when I worked at some of the bigger outlets and mm -hmm. I was so energized by that and it was so cool to feel like I was really touching people like in their daily lives. So, you know, for, I know students out there, especially at a place like Stanford, are very motivated to chase um, shiny things. Um, but uh, local news can be just so incredible. And so if you have the chance to do an internship or take your first job in a small town like Palm Springs, um, those places need you, they need smart people, um, but you also, I think, can really benefit from that experience. And then you can go on and do the glamorous things, but yeah. yeah. Well, try, this, is an event, try. this is an event I've wanted to hold for a long time, and I'm really glad that we did it, and especially on a week when there were a lot of dismal headlines about the news industry. I hope we had a little bit of positivity here, and you see these three all-stars who are actually working day in and day out to make sure we have incredible journalism that at the end of the day is going to be critical to sustaining our democracy. So thank you all for coming and please join me in thanking our panelists. And go out and buy a new subscription and have a, have a great night.